Welcome to Our College, Your Voices. I'm your host, Kara Monroe. I'm thrilled to have two distinguished guests on today's episode. Since 1971, the Indiana Commission for Higher Education has helped to define the missions of Indiana's public college system with the state and students in mind. The commission's work on behalf of Indiana's public colleges includes administering the state's financial aid programs. Those programs include the 21st Century Scholarship, the Frank O'Bannon Grant, the Adult Promise Grant, and the Next Level Jobs Workforce Ready Grant. The commission is a 14-member public body and is led by my first guest today, Indiana's Commissioner for Higher Education, Teresa Lubbers. Commissioner Lubbers has served in this role since 2009 and is the country's longest-serving state higher education officer and is known nationally as a trailblazer in higher education strategy and policy. My second guest is, of course, President Sue Elsperman, president of Ivy Tech. I'm excited for these two experts in higher education in Indiana to share about Indiana's higher education response to COVID-19. And now with that introduction, let's meet our panel. And first up is Teresa Lovers. Hello, Teresa. Hello, Kara. How are you today? I'm good. How are you? I'm doing just fine. Thank you. I'm enjoying uh, this opportunity to be with you and talk a little bit about what's happening in Indiana. Well, we're so excited to have you as a guest, and I would love for you to tell our audience a little bit more about you and what your role is here in Indiana. Well, I'm the Commissioner for Higher Education, and Indiana has what's called a coordinating board. So as that name would indicate, we coordinate a system of higher education. I've been in this role for 11 years now. I came to it after having served in the state Senate for 17 years, where I chaired the Education and Career Development Committee during a a large portion of those years. I've also had the privilege of serving on several national boards that are education and workforce related. Uh, I served as the chair of the state higher education executive officers and as the chair of the Midwestern Higher Education Compact and currently serve as the chair of what is the worst named organization ever, but it's the National Council of State Authorization Reciprocity Agreements. And what that is, is it's the organization that oversees the quality of online education across states, which is increasingly important and certainly important in the days that we are talking about today where online education is more important than ever. Absolutely. And I'm so grateful at being someone who's worked in distance education for most of my career that you have been so active with, it is unfortunately named, but NC Sarah, um, that organization, because it allowed Indiana to be one of the first to be recognized as a Sarah member. So thank you for your We were actually the first state to join NC Sarah. Yes. You're right, Kara. Yeah. Absolutely. I think Ivy Tech was the first institution in the state, if I remember correctly. We were pretty quick. So thank you for all you've done to lead higher education. I can't wait to have this conversation with you today. Thank you for that. And our other guest is Sue Elsperman. Welcome back to the show, Sue. Thank you, Kara. I'm very glad to be here and I'm honored to be here with Commissioner Teresa Lubbers. And would you just remind folks a little bit more about what you do here in the state of Indiana? I am the president of Ivy Tech Community College. It will be four years next month, which is hard to believe. But I also had the privilege prior to Ivy Tech working with Teresa Lubbers when uh, I was the vice chair of the Career Council back in my lieutenant governor days. And she was just making her transition from the Senate to commissioner when I was in the General Assembly. So um, it's really nice to be around such a an accomplished leader in our state. And uh, this time at Ivy Tech has been exciting. Four years here is exciting, always. That's right. That's right. Well, welcome to you both. And let's dive into the conversation. So we're going to focus quite a bit on COVID-19 and about what Indiana's response to it is. So we've been in this situation, we're recording on May 19th. So what were your initial thoughts or concerns or questions about COVID-19? And how does that compare to where we are today? Well, in my wildest imagination, I did not think it would be what it turned out to be. So I'm, you know, I did not see the future as it's turned out. I certainly knew that um, this was something that we were going to have to deal with in a different way. And we'll talk a lot about that in terms of how higher education has responded to it. But I didn't anticipate that I'd be working at my kitchen counter for two and a half months, you know, learning how to do all of these things in a different way in terms of Zoom and Microsoft Teams and all those kinds of things, or that we would see the you know, how serious this has been both from a health and certainly an economic standpoint as well. So I underestimated this and certainly like everyone else looking forward to managing this in a way that we can move forward. I would certainly build on what Teresa had said and thinking back to 
even March uh, at Ivy Tech, we knew that we needed to do things to make sure the campus was safe for our students, faculty, and staff. And I thought when we made the decision March 20th to close it, we'll be gone two, three, maybe four weeks, but surely we'll be back before the end of the term. And uh, it has, as Teresa said, it has been a strange world. I tell people I'm running one of the nation's largest community colleges from my 10 by 10 third bedroom <laughs> office in my little house in, in the south side of Indianapolis. And yet where we are today as a college is nothing short of impressive. Our faculty went virtual in a heartbeat. Um, we had already been a large online provider of quality education. As Kara, you know, you've led our Ivy Online efforts. Thank goodness we did that 18 months ago. We would not have been able to turn on a dime had we not done those actions and had the, the, the really strong backbone of the college to be able to support it. And I'm very proud of our students for having in for most cases they have done well and succeeded and proven that they can learn in both uh, online and virtual settings so uh, boy but no one expected us to be where we are today we are stronger as a result that's for sure we've learned a lot absolutely you've you've both talked about how your initial impression was none of us saw this coming how have the initial challenges, though, evolved over the past couple of months? Well, I think if you look specifically in the area of higher education, I think the um, overriding concern that I hear from presidents like Sue and from faculty and staff and others is just the uncertainty still and having to really have so many contingency plans because you don't really know for certain. Obviously, we, you know, we're concerned as we should be about enrollments and clearly about budgets and those issues are uppermost. But you know, you can start to plan for those things if in fact you know what it is for sure that you're planning for. But in, in this case, I think uh, I've seen everybody saying, okay, if, it's, if this is the scenario, this is like the best of the worst case and this is the worst of the worst case and we need to plan for all of these. So I, I do think that um, uh, that's been probably the evolving story has just been the, the the changes that are taking place daily. So almost every week you're reevaluating your plan. I think what sunk in a month or two ago was the impacts of unemployment. And, you know, we have uh, students who are on the lower end economically already and the impacts that those just astronomical numbers of unemployment in Indiana had and the impacts on our students or families, if it was parents and the children who would be going into college, those challenges at a whole nother level up beyond the COVID-19 uh, health concerns themselves. And we've seen, certainly our students have been, we've called it frozen for the last couple months. They're not sure what they can do, should do, can afford to do. And it has made um, what we thought we were beginning to see our path forward and we still do, but I think we're understanding that we really have to help our students um, make wise choices about how they move forward and ensure, as Teresa knows, fewer students have completed the FAFSA coming out of high school. We have many, many more students concerned about whether they will continue into higher education. So I think that's something that we didn't see coming much. And uh, it's, it's certainly one of the challenges we need to think through and make sure that we're meeting our students and those who should be at Ivy Tech or any four-year institution, meeting them where they are. What Sue has pointed out is exactly the right issue. And that is, you know, we're now at... Um, you know, six over 650,000 unemployment claims in the state of Indiana in just the recent months, nothing that we've ever seen before. And so we're working very hard and Sue and I are working together with on this proposal called Rapid Recovery uh, for a Better Future. 
I have the privilege of serving as the chair of the governor's workforce cabinet during this time. And Sue and Ivy Tech are key partners in this. And what we're really working to do is to disaggregate those numbers, find out who are these people who have many times never been had been filing unemployment before. And so how do we reach them? How many of them will go back to the job that they have? We hope a lot of them. Uh, how many of them will go back to their employer, but their job has changed and they need new skills? How many of them will not have a job to go back to because we've seen so many closures, especially with small businesses and certain areas, and we know those sectors that have been the hardest hit, how many of people will say, I'm not going through this again. I'm going to plan for the future, so I'm going to do something to skill up. And, you know, I believe higher education and all of its uh, component parts, from quality credentials to doctoral degrees, serves at the very nexus of this in terms of providing those opportunities for people. So while it's Obviously, not a place where we would choose to be. It is an opportunity for us to do what we probably needed to be doing before, which is to think about the changing nature of the world of work and how Hoosiers are going to prepare for that. Well, Teresa, that's a great segue to the next question that I want to talk about, which are what are some of the biggest opportunities that you've seen come out of this crisis? Well, I think higher education has an opportunity to prove its value proposition in a new way. And, and, and I think higher education institutions are stepping up and doing that. We certainly see this with Ivy Tech, how everything providing, uh, you know, assistance to your students through, I believe it's Ivy Assist, or I, if I have that mm-hmm. correctly, where mm-hmm. all the needs that people have, whether it's housing or food insecurity or the kinds of things that uh, impact a person's ability to think about Uh, going back into higher education. And so taking care of those very human needs. Our highly intensive research institutions, we see them engaging with the medical community, with looking at at the disease itself and how do we um, handle this and and prepare for the future in a different way. We see our higher education institutions working with communities and employers to actually engage with them to, you know, figure out this new world of technology and how they can be... um, more resilient in the future to the changes. So I think from a health standpoint, from an economic standpoint, from a student services standpoint, from a research standpoint, we see higher education stepping up in a way that they are, that higher education leaders are uniquely able to do. I, I, I love all of that. And I'll add just a couple more things I think we have seen. I think for many years, we thought the student had to come on campus, had to meet with an advisor physically, had to meet with financial aid physically, had to come in to see the bursar, all those things that in just the turn of a switch, we did them all virtually and they're all working. And we've been so much more student-centered in, again, meeting that student where they are. Kara and I served together on our Single Moms Initiative and we've been working over the last year and a half trying to make the college more friendly to those students like our single parents who have their hands completely filled, so many balls in the air. And any time we can make the college more flexible to the needs of our students, it's outstanding. And we learn that we can do really good advising through Zoom or over the phone or some virtual environment. And for those students not having to come on campus saves them a babysitter and it saves them a 30 minute drive each way and waiting in line and all kinds of things that we can still accomplish. And I'm so proud of our advisors for one, but all of our support staff for figuring out how to make those student services happen in a virtual world. And I think that's something we've learned a lot about that we'll take forward to be even more effective and help, again, serve our students in the best way that we can. I think we've all learned that we don't have to, with 18 campuses, we don't all have to drive to one location to meet all the time, which if you're a leader at Ivy Tech, you spend a lot of time, whether you're a chancellor or a vice chancellor of academic affairs, you spend a fair amount of time traveling around the state to all of the statewide meetings we're learning that we can do that very, very well in this virtual environment. And I hope that we will continue a lot of that in making our world more productive, kinder on how we treat one another, on the wear and tear of of, of trying to accomplish so many things. But I think in all cases, they're great opportunities. And 
Carrie, you're evolving a concept that we're calling Learn Anywhere for the college, which I think is super exciting, which would give a, a student the opportunity to on any given week, take a class in person, uh, synchronously in a virtual or asynchronously. And when you talk about meeting our students where they are, that's exciting. So I know we're just maybe piloting that at this point, but what a great, those are the kinds of great breakthroughs that will help us ensure that students succeed in their endeavors going forward. I also think that Ivy Tech is uniquely positioned to um, to do what we're uh, really encouraging all institutions to do, which is to really recognize the knowledge and experience that people have when they show up, however they show up to a, a campus. So, you know, with these, you know, thousands of, uh, hundreds of thousands of people who are unemployed, these were people who were working for the most part. They had attained skills. They had they had experiences. They had knowledge. I mean, if you worked at Macy's, you're in customer service, and now you have a whole new area of customer service. So how we actually move this movement toward competency-based and acknowledge what we refer to as prior learning and encourage people because that, res- you know, they're crushed, many of them right now. They never anticipated this situation. Restoring a sense of dignity to their lives by acknowledging that, yes, you've done many valuable things. You know a lot of things, and we're going to recognize that, and it's going to save you time and money as you now pivot to a new, a new place of employment or a new, a new career. And I really, you know, I know we've been moving down this path to do this. It's hard because it's different than the way we did things before. But it's really critically important to encourage people at this point to move forward. And if I can build on what you shared there, Teresa, you know that we have just stood up our CCEC, Career Coaching and Employer Connections, with the support of the Commission and the Lilly Endowment and many other great partners uh, in the state. That Having that structure now is so critical to helping Hoosiers find what that new Uh, what's needed out there to make that pivot, as you said. I'm really excited that we will now have the career coaches out there that can help that individual pivot and to quickly adjust our programming, be they certificates, certifications, or degrees that help them find that next path in their career. Yeah, it is an exciting time and we're learning to operate in a much more agile rapid fashion. One of the things that we're doing with uh, the new uh, program, a rapid recovery for a better future is, you know, we have a pretty sophisticated landing page, which is sophisticated in that it drills down to what people really need to know. Simple in that it starts with a very, very simple questions. You know, I'm looking for a new job. I'm looking for education training. I'm looking for the supports that I, that I need as well. But I think this is one of the ways that we're really trying to reach out to people to meet them where they are and individualize their message. We found out we were calling this the, the, the site originally, we were calling it, we were going to call it Future Finder. And we discovered in conversations with people that that was a little off putting to them. And it was, it was written with some anxiety because they're so in, living in the present right now that thinking about their future, as important as that might be, seems overwhelming to them. So instead of that, we're calling it your next step. You know, all we're asking people to do is take one step forward that could improve their opportunities. And we found that that is a better way for us to to bring them to what they really want to do with a sense of assurance that they can do it. So I think all of these efforts that we have are sort of converging in a way that are that's creating a clear and compelling message to Hoosiers about how they can move out of this. So, Teresa, you've been talking a lot about some of the different things that are going on right now with the commission. Um, And I'd love for you to just focus just on the commission for a little while. What have you and the commission been doing to help students and colleges get through this time of upheaval? The first thing that we really did was look at well-intended policies that we had or requirements for students that are the right ones. We're not walking away from them permanently, but in this period of time, we recognized that we needed to provide flexibility to schools and to students who, for no fault of their own, were not going to be able to meet some of those requirements, whether they were academic or financial. 
So the requirements of completing 30 credit hours in order to receive the maximum financial aid over a period of time, we based that on the first semester instead of the full year. The requirements that we had for for some of our 21st century scholars, and we can talk about that as well in terms of the scholar success program, they're the right requirements to have, but if it's impossible for a student to do it, then you have to provide flexibility on that as well. So we're looking at flexibility in uh, the areas of, for example, students are not able to take SAT or ACT. And so would that be a requirement for either the scholars or for the schools in the fall? So I, I think the big thing is to provide flexibility going forward. We're seeing this, in, you know, we'll be talking more about this in the future as we think about preparing budgets and it, when it's really a pandemic budget for the first time, you're not thinking about a normal time. So I would say primarily it's really for uh, flexibility as much as possible. We've been working with our congressional de delegation in D.C. to tr provide comparable flexibility there. One of the areas we're hearing about now from the colleges and universities is their concern about liability. So when students come back, even if you've covered all of your bases as best you can, there's not going to it's not going to be risk free. And so at what point do you have reasonable liability provided to institutions who are attempting to do the right things? And I, I really think that probably will ultimately be handled in D.C., but we may need to do some of that here in Indiana through the legislature as well. So I, I really do believe it's focused on academic and financial flexibility and then dealing with policies and programs for this period of time that we may need to look at differently, even if they are well-intentioned and good policies. Thank you so much. And Sue, I'd love for you to talk a little bit about how Ivy Tech has been supporting our faculty, staff, and students. And then Teresa, I'll ask you to add on if there's anything else um, from the broader view of other institutions that you'd like to add. So Sue, will you start that one? Well, our faculty and staff have been just amazingly flexible to meet the needs of our students. So I know, Kara, you're the provost. You and your team have made every resource available to our faculty to make their transition into a virtual world for those who had not done online learning or virtual before. Having that strong IV online, the ed tech staff that we have across the state to support them and everywhere. Our OIT, our information technology team, have been nothing short of amazing across the state, helping our faculty and staff have the technology they need. And I'm going to add the students because they have re-imaged hundreds of laptops that have gone out to our students who didn't have technology. They have sourced hotspots for both faculty, staff, and students. They have gotten uh, little keyboards to connect to, to iPhones for, for because believe it or not, Teresa, a lot of our students take their classes on their iPhone, but they have to do papers and things. So you can actually put a wireless uh, keyboard with an iPhone to do that. But they've done, they've done amazing things to help us. Oh, and of course, Wi-Fi in our parking lots and you name it, they've figured it out. So I think that's all been important. To our students, I want to speak about one particular initiative, Mary Ann Glick and Mike Woods, who gave half a million dollars a match to the college, all uh, unrestricted to support our students, staff, and campuses. We have matched over that uh, million dollar mark, and through our Ivy Cares, any student can bring any concern they have, and we have a way, in addition to the CARES Act dollars that we received from the federal government, these unrestricted dollars help us take care of our students in ways that that money is much more restrictive. So there's so many things. And I, uh, I, I think we have figured out, we're figuring out that there's a whole lot of ways we can support one another. Those continue to emerge. And I expect that we're only learning the beginning of it, but couldn't be more proud of the many things that uh, I've seen happening across our college thus far. You know, one of my overriding concerns, and I know Sue shares this and you do too as well, Kara, is that what this whole period of time uh, has shown is what we already recognized in terms of the disparity in terms of everything from devices to connectivity to financial uh, concerns has just, again, been, become more visible to all of us. 
Uh, I'll use as an ex most recent example, we extended uh, the deadline for the FAFSA completion. You know, those you know, have to complete that in order to receive any sort of financial aid. We found out that overall, I think in the nation, the numbers for FAFSA completion went down about 5%. Our numbers actually went up a little bit, a little less than 2% this year, but not with our low-income students. We, we did not find that true with our low-income students, with the exception being, again, our scholars. So um, this is a significant concern for us, how we actually address all of these issues related to equity and opportunity. The governor's discretionary fund, which is a part of the CARES Act that Sue referred to, Indiana's getting $61.6 million there. We're really working with the governor's office to try to make sure that we address particularly connectivity, devices, and, and the uh, version to e-learning for both our K-12 partners and in higher ed as well. I think this is exposed disparities that we have to deal with in especially poor urban areas and poor rural areas. And there, and of course, the what combines both of those are really issues related to poverty. So I think we have an opportunity here to do what again we should have done before, which is look with uh, honesty at those disparities that exist and try to address them. So my last question for you two today is: What's the state doing to help those um, six hundred and almost 650,000, I think we're at 640,000 right now, folks who are unemployed or need to pursue new skills or education right now. And you've talked a little bit about it, but let's wrap that up for our listeners as they, as they think about this episode and are talking to family and friends who um, may be experiencing that same situation. Sue, why don't you start with your 10,000 initiative and some of the things you're doing, and I'll try to do a little state perspective at the end. About Six weeks ago, as we realized that this unemployment was uh, coming on strong, we began to think about how could Ivy Tech be part of the solution of bringing people back quickly. And as Karen knows, we have an executive strategy and planning group that meets multiple times a week to really plan the future, not just policies for the college, but how do we move forward? And one of the ideas that popped was 10,000 free courses. Could we help these recently unemployed Hoosiers who didn't expect to be here, could we give them something that would help them get moving? And so actually, as we speak, the end of this week, we're standing up an effort which allows uh, those Hoosiers to come back and take free courses in mostly non-credit initially with the partnerships that we have with folks like Amitrol and the uh, Industry 4.0 Smart Manufacturing uh, automation initiative certification that are high, high value, who've offered to allow Hoosiers to take those for free unlimitedly through uh, early July. We think that there, and we have other partnerships like Trilogy in the, some of their healthcare manager uh, courses, as those who would move into management can do those for free, other MSSC and other certifications, including our own, where we have a college license to LinkedIn Learning, uh, another great place that if they, they have a student email that Hoosiers could have access to that whole LinkedIn Learning library. So that initiative is kicking off. It will dovetail, be part of the rapid recovery for a better future. One more way that we as a college will help, but we think our ability to pivot quickly with the certificate certifications degrees that will be in demand to now in the summer, in the fall, are going to be critical to helping the unemployed find those great opportunities. And again, as I mentioned, the CCEC, I think our new CCEC will be critical in making sure that those unemployed Hoosiers are really directed uh, in really smart ways towards the great careers that are out there and will help them succeed going forward. That's a great example of what Ivy Tech is doing and they, Ivy Tech is it's so important uh, in the outreach of this rapid recovery period of time. The Governor's Workforce Cabinet has been working uh, to actually bring together the resources and, and uh, allow individuals to connect their resources with the people who need them. So we're creating an online hub, uh, which actually goes live. It's out there starting right now. We are going to launch the whole rapid recovery effort the first uh, week of June with the governor. 
what we've been working hard to do is, while understandably, there's been the focus on getting people healthy and getting people to be able to deal with this virus, we have been saying, you know, sequentially, not sequentially, but concurrently, we're going to be working on making sure that there's a lifeline for people as they need to get their lives back again. So we have an online hub that connects people with the resources. We're actually working with an outreach network. What we know is that for many individuals, the decision to go back may come from an encouragement from a pastor, a teacher, a community leader. So really working um, at the local level with community organizations and faith-based institutions to make sure that they understand the resources that are available, that you can get a tuition-free, workforce-ready grant in a high-demand area. And it's it will basically be assurance that you will get a job because we know we need people in these jobs, but we need people to know about that. We're really working with career coaching and mentoring uh, through um, Skillful and our Work One offices to make sure that they are um, know exactly what is out there in terms of resources. We mentioned earlier uh, assessing people's skills and through prior learning assessments, making sure that they can take advantage of going into the market with a skills assessment, telling people what they have already done. And then we're ob obviously working with our employer community. This is not going to be the work of state agencies. I mean, this is going to be the work of communities, state agencies, and employers all working together. And so I think Hoosiers can expect to have better online resources. They can get training opportunities in, in tuition-free ways. They can get coaching, skills assessment, and support for their personal needs that you both have talked about before that may stand in the way, mental health, food supports, and other needs. So we're really trying to have a comprehensive package. And I believe that Indiana is leading the way in terms of our rapid recovery efforts. Sue and Teresa, thank you so much for joining us. We end every episode with a call to action. Um, and Teresa and Sue have shared some extremely important ways that Indiana Higher Education is here to support Hoosiers so that you can move forward. You heard how critical it is to improve your skills now, whether that's a short-term workforce certificate, a two-year associate degree, or a four-year bachelor's degree or higher. One of the best resources to show how state and local policies impact Indiana's Higher Education Commission is the Commission's series of data and policy analysis analysis reports. You can find those at www.che.in.gov slash reports. Again, that's www.che.in.gov forward slash reports. And Ivy Tech remains ready to serve you. Visit www.ivytech.edu forward slash apply now to get started on your educational goals. We'll put both of those website addresses in today's show notes. Thank you for listening to this episode of Our College Your Voices. I want to thank the two members of today's panel, Teresa Lubbers, Indiana Commissioner for Higher Education. You can find Teresa on Twitter at Teresa Lubbers, I-N, that's T-E-R-E-S-A-L-U-B-B-E-R-S-I-N. And Sue Elsperman, president of Ivy Tech Community College. You can find Sue on Twitter at Sue Elsperman, S U E. E-L-L-S-P-E-R-M-A-N-N. -N. I'm your host, Kara Monroe. You can connect with me on Twitter at k and Tweets. I want to thank Charlie Beezer at the Commission for Higher Education who helped to produce today's episode. Don't forget, you can reach us by email at ourcollegeyourvoices at ivytech.edu. Leave us a voicemail at 317-572-5049. That's a great way to ask a question of a future listener or just to share your experiences. If you are an Ivy Tech faculty or staff member, join our Microsoft Teams listener community. Our website is www.ivytech.edu forward slash podcast. Production assistance for this and every episode provided by Becky Campbell, Sarah Ferguson, and the Ivy Tech Community College marketing team. And our podcast concept is by Matthew Pittman. Theme music and post-production services are provided by the incredible Jen Eads at the Brassi Broadcasting Company. And we will talk to you next time on Our College, Your Voices.